All right. So, engineering social technologies for a responsible future. Why ethics matters? So, some years ago, we had a paradigm which basically was um, very much data driven, right? So, the idea was that basically uh, you collect as much data as you can, and then the data tells you. Uh, what is going on in the world and what has to be done. And basically, some people went so far to say that we wouldn't need science anymore. In other words, also scientists wouldn't be needed any longer. And in that time, basically, secret services and companies have started to collect uh, as much data as they could really get hold of. And for example, CIA director Gus Hunt said, you're already a walking sensor platform. So computers, smartphones, iPads, and so on, contain a lot of sensors and they're collecting data. By the way, also, he said, when your smartphone is turned off, it doesn't matter, the CIA can get the data. And he also said that the CIA was very nearly within um, the possibility to compute on all human-generated information. And it's very hard to imagine how much information that is, but I recently read, and I'm not entirely sure that's true, that the NSA had 140 terabytes of storage space for every single person on Earth. So what can you do with that? For example, create personality profiles. There is even a company called Crystal Nose that is offering to see anyone's personality, which means also you know your neighbors, your friends, your enemies, whatever. Just imagine what harm can be done with that kind of information. But anyway, so. That's the situation that uh, we've seen in recent years. And then, of course, the AI revolution was on its way. And some people say we'll see super intelligence within this century. Some people say it's going to be much earlier. And um, there are even people who are as extreme as Ray Kurzweil, who suggests that we would see super intelligence that's going to be as intelligent as all human brains in the world. I'm not so sure about this, but anyway, what we've seen is that AI systems have become ever more powerful and have been able not only to beat people in check and char party, um, a knowledge game, but also they've uh, been able to beat uh, the world champion in Go, and Go is a game which is considered to be much more complex than Jess and uh, requires a lot of strategic thinking. So most people have expected that AI would be able to beat the world champion only in about 15, 20 years, and it already happened back in 2016. And then we had Alpha Zero, a system that was basically teaching itself how to play Go by playing with, its, with itself millions of times. And then newspapers started to write, <clears throat> um, AI doesn't need a teacher anymore. It's, it's more or less like God. Of course, that's highly controversial, but anyway, there were voices like this and not too few. And uh, so what can be done with that kind of system is, of course, also to learn about people's um, behavior, about people's personality, weaknesses and strengths and how to manipulate them. And this knowledge is being used, for example, for neuromarketing. That's a kind of marketing which is basically tailored to your personality, is very much targeted. And it's also 
created in such a way that in many cases you would not even notice you have been manipulated. So you're being manipulated subconsciously. That's the trick. And uh, also in the past years, there have been large scale simulation tools to simulate populations, entire countries. Um, some people call it war games on the grander scale. And um, this is also about so-called psychological operations. I mean, how to influence the thinking in a country. And it might have played a role even back during the Arab Spring. But um, things didn't stop there. As you've probably read, there's a social credit score, which is being tested in China and actually being rolled out China-wide here. People are being surveilled with a lot of cameras. I think China wanted to have about 500 million cameras. And um, this is using face recognition and all sorts of other algorithms to basically monitor, judge and control the population. So everything that people do or don't do might get plus or minus points and the resulting social credit score uh, would determine the kind of jobs one can get, the countries one can travel to, and even whether you can still take the plane or a fast train and also the speed of the internet connection. So this is pretty invasive, one could say, and some people call it technological totalitarianism. And it even doesn't stop there. I mean, also in the meantime, it turns out that people think about using algorithms for life and death decisions. So there has been a lot of debate about autonomous systems, in particular autonomous vehicles. And uh, the debate was about the question what to do if an accident couldn't be avoided and somebody would die and um, it had to be decided in a sense who would die and who would survive. So that's the kind of problem that's often called a trolley problem and uh, it's, it's highly controversial and highly problematic. Um, there's in the meantime software that decides about life and death using personal data potentially. So for example, for hospital treatments. And um, as I said, th this really has very severe consequences for individual people and for society altogether in particular, what that means for democracy, for a society based on law. In fact, more generally, one can say that uh, we've been entering a regime where code is law. That means algorithms decide in more and more situation what can be done and what cannot be done. So rather than lawyers and politicians, it's computer programmers and system designers who decide about what is possible in society and what is not. And these people don't necessarily have a background in law, in sociology, in history, in ethics, in psychology or whatever. So. This, this also has uh, pretty problematic implications. Some of them are basically acting as, we say, social engineers. That means that they're interfering with our lives and with society on an everyday basis. 
the services that you get on the internet are very much personalized. Even prices are personalized, but not only this, also what you get to see and what you get offered, the kinds of products and services that you can buy pretty much depend now on that kind of personalized curation. And some of that is, is not necessarily very positive only. I mean, there are a lot of potentials, obviously, and um, I have be always been a strong supporter of the digital technology, but the question is really how to use it. And we're talking here about socio-technical systems. We cannot divide them apart anymore. It's not a social system and a technical, but it's really intermixed. And it means that we cannot solve the problems of the world by technology only. We also need social innovation. And that has become clear in recent years. In fact, you may wonder how I got uh, into Essex as a previous physicist who then did traffic science and then eventually sociology and got interested in digital technologies through the Future ICT project uh, back in 2010. Well, it has a lot to do actually with TU Delft, one of the partner universities of ETH series. So I happened to receive an honorary PhD back in uh, 2014, as far as I remember. And um, as a result, we set up a PhD program in Delft that was announced in The Economist. And it was about engineering social technologies for a responsible digital future. And as you can imagine, there were a lot of people notice, noticing this one page ad. And that uh, triggered debate and a lot of international engagement into this research subject. So suddenly a lot of universities were starting to engage into this subject. The program started back in 2015 and then towards autumn, we had some first publications like this one, uh, Build Digital Democracy. This was basically suggesting an alternative digital paradigm that was aimed at upgrading democracy with digital means rather than by replacing democracy, as some people have been saying, as an outdated technology. We saw it, it just had to be upgraded. And then a few weeks later, there was also the Digital Manifest that was published in the Spectrum der Wissenschaft, later on also in Scientific American, but it took more than a year for them to publish the English version, even though that was around immediately after the German publication. So the title of that Digital Manifest was Digitale Demokratie statt Daten Diktatur. And even though Spectrum der Wissenschaft is not a very huge paper, it is, or journal, it is, it has had quite some impact, I believe. And uh, I'll just give you an idea of uh, what happened. So, for example, sometime later, the president of Germany, Steinmeier uh, was speaking about a deadly danger for democracy. And you've probably noticed that there is a book, new book out there by Britain and Kaiser. It's called Die Daten Diktatur in the German translation. In English, it says the Cambridge Analytica whistleblowers inside story of how big data, Trump and Facebook broke democracy and how it can happen again. And here on the left, you see another 
whistleblower from Cambridge Analytica, Christopher Ville. He also recently published his own book. And uh, they basically have both given the general public an insight into the use of military information technology for propaganda and for the manipulation of elections, something that certainly can have a negative impact on democracy. Also, there were activities in Switzerland. Uh, for example, there was a meeting of 50 digital shapers, as they called it, and the event was called the Digital uh, Digital Manifest of Bern, or uh, Digital Manifesto for Switzerland. So you can see uh, basically that publication created some waves and uh, political activity. Also, at some point in time, somebody sent me a link to activities of the White House, and it said the White House is preparing for the future of artificial intelligence. And um, one of the persons who is really deeply involved into this is John Havens, um, who actually praises over here the English translation of the Digital Manifest uh, in Scientific American, which has the title, well, Will Democracy Survive Big Data and Artificial Intelligence? You know, <laughs> some people at Twitter said, certainly not. Uh, but of course, other people thought we had something to do about uh, the situation. And so John Havens is leading an activity by IEEE, which is the biggest engineering organization of the world, uh, to come up with ethically aligned design guidelines. I mean, guidelines that basically all companies um, and all engineers should follow. There has also been a European group on ethics and science and new technology has been issued a statement on artificial intelligence, robotics and autonomous systems. One of my colleagues in Delft who started that PhD program with me Jeroen van den Hoeken has actually been involved in the creation of this. And just a few days ago, you've probably heard that um, Mrs. van der Leyen, the new EU president, has unveiled uh, human-centric artificial intelligence data strategy. And down here, uh, you can read that uh, she wants that digital Europe reflects the best of Europe, open, fair, diverse, democratic, and confident, right? Now, also, the World Economic Forum, as you can see, has taken up on this. So there was an article written by me, how, to, how we can engineer Again, a more responsible digital future. Now, so here's actually the, the brochure of the PhD program. And then have a look at uh, the network down here. So that shows up actually in the design of, of a poster or announcement of a digital ethics conference that uh, took place uh, in Bonn back in March 2019 and was very much run by companies. So basically IT companies are now discovering ethics as um, market. So they are tr trying to develop products that are focused on ethical issues and uh, ethics becomes basically a competitive advantage. And that is um, something, it creates extra economic value from the point of view of these companies. So this is a very interesting development, I would say. 
Now, why do we need to be careful, you know, and in particular, how, how can we engineer a more responsible digital future? Well, we need to be careful about inappropriate generalizations, right? I mean, you can write an algorithm for anything and everything. The algorithm doesn't know whether it's about elementary particles or animals or people. But that should make a big difference, right? And there have been quite a few people who have been developing big data algorithms for uh, elementary particle physics, and these algorithms are extremely powerful in terms of how much data they can handle. And some of these people have also gotten interested in social applications and societal applications, and so they take their algorithms and adjust them somehow to apply it to our society. That means also, in a sense, to you. And the question is, you know, how far can you go? And uh, should you do this? Like, um, should you apply um, algorithm that has been created for uh, many particle systems to, say, chicken or pigs, you know? When certainly with the use of algorithm, you can optimize farms, right? Uh, but then if you apply the same kind of algorithms or slightly adapted ones to society, uh, wouldn't we end up in an animal farm society? You know, it's quite um, char characteristic, however, that um, many countries are applying big data algorithms to identify terrorists and criminals. By the way, there are a lot of false uh, positives here. I mean, basically false alarms of more than 90% of alarms are wrong. So there are kind of concerns about the quality of these algorithms. In the meantime, big data algorithms are also used um, in order to find unemployment and they're used to run entire societies, like I mentioned the social credit score in China. And then, you know, we, we could end up to, with applying these algorithms that were derived from many particle systems to everyone. The question is, should we do that? And if you ask, uh, how should we do it? Because there are many different ways of doing it. Now, as you know, there's a UN Charter of Human Rights. Human dignity is at the center of this. It's also the basis of democracies. And the view is that human dignity is not given if we are being treated like an object. But if we're being surveilled in everything that we're doing, like not only in the public, but also at work, at home, in the living room, kitchen, sleeping room, everywhere, then, you know, are we being treated like an object? If we don't have real decision rights, real possibilities to shape the, the code is law principle. And we have some influence on how that code works and uh, what we can do in society. Do we really have still human dignity or have you basically given up on that to a large extent? That's the kind of questions that people are looking into. Some very serious questions in particular, as I mentioned, when it comes to life and death decisions. Now, another issue is that if you 
run a data-driven and AI-controlled society, you may totally forget about all those things that cannot be well quantified. And human dignity is just one of them. Love and consciousness and freedom are other concepts that we really don't know how to quantify them well. We, we, we don't understand them well. And so in a data-driven society, the danger is that you optimize everything which is based on data, but whatever cannot be put into numbers will be forgotten, right? And so is, is this going to result in a, a human society? Uh, or is it going to end up in a society that's made for, say, robots? So people have um, become more and more aware that we need to, to design information platforms and systems for values. That means built in the values of our constitution, of our culture, into these kind of systems in order to avoid conflicts of interest in order to make sure that those systems support that values that we care about and that we have basically developed over hundreds of years because they have served us well. And of course, you can design for privacy, you can uh, design for justice or fairness, you can design for security or safety, but also solidarity. You can also design for democracy, right? Recently, a German president has demanded that we should uh, engage into a democratization of the digital world. And so the question comes up, what then does democracy mean? I mean, what, what should be built into the digital systems if you want to upgrade democracy digitally? Then a lot of what is listed here and maybe more should be taken on board, like human rights, human dignity. How do you do that? Um, freedom, self-determination, pluralism, protection of minorities, division of power, checks and balances, participation, transparency, fairness, justice, legitimacy, uh, anonymous equal votes, and privacy in the sense of protection from misuse or exposure and in the sense of the right to be left alone. And I mentioned self-determination. I think this is actually one of the most important principles because if it's possible to manipulate people's behavior and thinking and emotions and lives with big data, we would basically lose at least some control over our lives if we are not able to control our own data. And so basically you would need to have a platform for informational self-determination. So suppose um, all the personal data that's being collected would be sent to a personal data mailbox, your data mailbox. But in contrast to the situation today, you would have a password and could decide what company could use what part of that data for what pe uh, period of time and purpose and maybe price, then you were in control, right? Companies could, in principle, offer you any personalized product or service, but you would have to agree with the degree of personalization. You could say, I don't want it to be personalized, say a news portal. You could say, I want it to be fully personalized, like take all the data that you can get about me to personalize it. Or you could say, 
I just want it to be personalized according to say region, gender, age, and um, level of intelligence or whatever, you know. So in order for the companies to get access to your data and create additional profit, you would have to trust those companies because otherwise you wouldn't decide to share your personal data. So there would be a competition among companies for trust. And I would create a trusted uh, digital society. Um, there would of course be a lot of data. We don't want people to spend a lot of time on managing their data. So everyone would have a personal digital assistant AI base that would learn your personal preferences, what companies you trust, which ones you don't trust, what kind of data you're willing to share with whom, and all that would be pre-configured, would be very easy basically to use that platform. That, that's the idea, and it would create benefits basically for people, for politics, and for business. Of course, people would get their informational self-determination and control back over their data and lives. Uh, companies could get access to more data, also small and medium-sized companies, um, spin-off companies, research institutions such as ATH, and also NGOs and civil society projects and so on could have access to data as long as people trust them and open up the data. And of course, politics would also benefit from this data, could make good statistics and so on. Now, there are some other dangers that we have to overcome, like, um, of course, we can use big data to control the world to a larger extent than we could do that before, but should we do it? And to, uh, if yes, to what extent? Because in these difficult times, you know, with climate emergency and other kinds of problems, we need a lot of innovation basically to solve our problems. And innovation always questions the existing paradigm. So, it's always in conflict basically with the existing system even. And so if, if you basically control um, a society and people's thinking, then the level of innovation would probably go down dramatically. So we need to make sure that there is some sufficient degree of freedom in this digital society of the future. Now, of course, we can use artificial intelligence to automate all sorts of processes, logistics, traffic, even cities. You now, smart cities is a key word. Some people talk even about smart nations. Now, a lot of this is about automation. But if you do it like this, you know, here we assume there are six criteria that we are measuring. And um, if we have three, up to three criteria speaking for yes, then it's no. If we have four or five or six criteria speaking for yes, then the decision yes will be taken. But basically, Whatever measurement is being made, you know, there's yes or no, and the system decides by itself. There's no degree of freedom over here. If we build the world like this, of course, we cannot really be creative and innovative anymore. But we could, of course, build systems in a different way, but it means like engineers, software engineers would have to build systems in a different way. So, for example, we could say, oh, if there is uh, most criteria speaking in favor of yes, then it's a clear yes, and the algorithm should decide. 
if very few criteria speak in favor of yes, then it's a clear no. And also the algorithm should decide, but say if there's three or four or six criteria which are in favor of yes, then maybe we cannot be that sure because it matters so much weight we give to those different criteria. And, and maybe in that case, a human should look into this more carefully and to take a decision. So we, we should basically semi-automate systems in a sense, right? Which gives people degrees of freedom for those things that matter. So, you know, in our lives, there are, in a sense, decision points where we decide about friends and family and, and jobs and our future. And I'm not sure we really want to hand over a decision about these things to an algorithm or to a machine or whether we wouldn't expect the machine to tell us. Now, we are at an important decision point here and these are the obvious options, you know, and these are the pros and cons of those different options. What do you choose? And that should happen here and there. And um, of course, it needs to be built into those systems. Otherwise, we'll lose our freedom and innovation capacity, as I said before. Okay, and one of, one of the approaches that basically is pretty much compatible with democracy and freedom and participation, but still extremely efficient is self-organization. Like um, many particle or many component systems are often complex systems. Uh, here, uh, a flock of birds is just one of the examples where we can see, wow, how, how does that actually work? There's obviously not a single bird that is controlling that collective behavior, but there is a large degree of coordination happening, right? And the idea that society could work this way is pretty old, like 300 years old, the fable of bees, pretty much been influential for our economic system and thinking. And the question is, you know, can we upgrade that with digital technologies? In effect, we can. So, for example, we've done that for traffic systems. Here you will see a computer simulation of stop and go traffic as it, it, it is actually happening in the real world every day. Pretty annoying, of course. And so the question is, what can we do about it? Now, first of all, we get mad about this traffic jam. It will take a helicopter and we'll see what the actual reason is for that traffic jam. So you can see there's an on-ramp on the right. Vehicles are trying to enter the freeway. That is producing small disruptions in the traffic flow. Those are being amplified and it creates stop and go traffic, a uh, traffic jam. Now we'll activate a traffic assistance system. Here, cars are being equipped with a radar sensor that measures dis distances and relative velocities, and it will be a, an automated acceleration and deceleration in a slightly different way. So basically, we change the interactions between cars while the inflow into the system stays exactly the same. So you can see we can dissolve the traffic jam and get free flow just by changing the interactions. And that can be done by real-time measurement and real-time feedback, such that the interactions are changed just a little bit. And the self-organization of the system leads to a desirable outcome, free traffic flow. We've also been thinking about how to apply this principle to urban traffic flows and intersections. 
And I really love showing this kind of movie from Egypt, which shows highly diverse traffic, but no traffic jam. And all of that fluent traffic comes by self-organization. But self-organization only works because of a particular design of the intersection. So what you have here is a unidirectional flow in the front and an opposite unidirectional flow in the back. And in between there is a buffer and that buffer allows people to adjust their speed such that there is a gap in the flow when they want to cross it. And as you can see, it worked quite well. Now the question is, can we learn something from this? And can we basically upgrade it digitally? And the answer is yes, we can. So we've been inspired here by oscillatory flows as we've seen them in pedestrian flows. Here's a simulation of pedestrians at the bottleneck. And so there's one flow direction and people on the other side have to wait and there are more and more people arriving that increases the pressure. The increase in pressure is changing the flow direction. And it doesn't need a traffic light or a policeman. All of that is based on self organization. Now we've said to ourselves, intersections in traffic flow are basically also a bottleneck. Couldn't we have self-organized traffic flows, oscillations actually, to define traffic lights? That means, couldn't the traffic flows control the traffic lights rather than the other way around? And yes, it works very nicely. You can see over here on the right, green waves that are emerging as a result of that self-organization, which works bottom-up, right? Rather than uh, being controlled by a traffic control center. And actually, this has been applied to, to a pretty complex traffic network in Dresden, which is also cut through by all sorts of tram lines and buses. And the problem is that you would like to prioritize public transport, but at the same time, you want to have green waves. And actually, it turns out the approach that we developed works pretty well. So you get flexible green waves. It's, it's the, the stuff that you see down here. It's our system as compared to the system that they had before, which imposes a certain green wave to the system, but doesn't allow for prioritization of public transport. With our approach, it turns out that you could improve travel times for all the involved participants, for public transport, for individualized traffic, and for pedestrian and cyclists. It's, by the way, also good for the environment. And currently, they're testing this in Lucerne, and it's going to be tested uh, also, I heard today, in Zurich and in uh, cities in, in Germany as well. So. It's a completely new approach, which seems to be really superior to what we had before. And so then can we extend this principle of digitally assisted self organization to society? And the answer is probably yes. I mean, you've heard of Nobel Prize winner Elinor Ostrom. She's, uh, she's made a lot of empirical case studies in Switzerland. And uh, she figured out that there are principles of self-governance that are efficient, but you need to have proper design principles of these systems. So what she was interested in was how to overcome tragedies of the commons. So you can see over here on the left-hand side of that yellow border, in one country, all the trees are basically gone with a few exceptions. While on the right hand side, there are still a lot of trees, right? So obviously the outcome very much depends on 
the kinds of interactions in the social system. And that is part of an area of research as being called evolutionary game theory and mechanism design, which is about ways, finding ways how to change the outcome of social interactions by adding some social mechanism or some feedback principle into the system. And in fact, there are many decentralized approaches that can actually support cooperation, avoid tragedies of the commons. We've also been working in my team at cost and computational social science professorship uh, to come up with platforms that can help us to be more sustainable. Here, for example, in the asset project, we've come up with a product finder that would, where you can determine what you what are your values, your preferences, how important is the price for you, how much weight you want to give to environmental issues, to social issues, to health issues. And then basically it scans all sorts of product information. You don't have to read it yourself, but it figures out what are the best products according to your preferences. And it will change your behavior accordingly. So this is basically the opposite approach to what we have today, where people are being nudged by a company to buy certain kind of products, which may not be actually in compliance with their own values. This approach over here makes sure that uh, you would comply better with your own values, but also the companies would benefit because people start spending um, more money actually on the products that they value and they're trying out new products. And uh, one other team member, Yukti, has been working on a so-called digital mirror that's basically giving you feedback about your behavior and the impact that this behavior has on the environment and society, as much we can do that. And it's a decentralized approach. You're in control of your data, but it helps you basically show more beautiful behavior in a sense. And uh, Marcus has been involved in a project that we call FIN4 or Social Ecological Finance System, the multi dimensional real time feedback system that we're working on in order to come up with incentives for a more sustainable society that would also be able to take on board a lot of more other values that we care about. Now, you can see there are many different ways to design digital systems. And so some people suggest that basically the development of our society is technology driven. But we can use technology in different ways. And ethics should be helping us like a compass to make decisions on how we should use this kind of technology or how we would want to use this kind of technology so it serves us better. And that's why we have this course over here. You should start to learn to think about ethical issues when it comes to technology. And in many cases, I should say there are no final answers. A lot of this is about creating awareness for what matters. It's creating awareness for unwanted side effects feedback effects, interaction effects um, that you should keep in mind when you're designing these kinds of systems. So you don't get in the end an outcome that you don't want it to get. 
uh, Essex, again, is, is also not one monolithic field that has a um, scheme to arrive at one single answer. There are actually different kinds of ethics. Until, uh, deontic ethics, for example, and utilitarian ethics and so on. And you need to be also very careful what ethics to choose in order not to get an outcome that you didn't want. For example, there is utilitarian ethics and it's pretty much oriented at optimization as our capitalist society is. So if you apply such kind of an ethics and basically you get something which is similar to capitalism. Right, but you would also start to put a price tag to everything that's out there, to CO2, but also to human organs and to human lives. And this is where the problems come in, right? Uh, we probably shouldn't give a human life a certain value because if we start doing that, a lot of terrible things can happen. And that's why Typically, we have a different kind of ethics uh, for our civil society. While there is also an ethics for war times, which is quite a different ethics. And now, if we happen to apply wartime ethics to peacetime civil society, you can imagine that you would end up in a completely different society. So. You know, it, it takes some time to learn to think in ethical categories and what it implies, but it's basically something that should help us to come up with solutions that serve people better. Shouldn't be thought of as something that's putting obstacles in our way. So the idea is that if we take wiser decisions, if we here and there do some self-restraint, then basically it would end up with collective effects in our society that would benefit us, us all. And that, that is the wisdom basically that ASICS aims at. And um, I hope that this course will be interesting for you, that uh, you'll learn to pay attention to these issues. And I personally believe that we're now living in a highly complex world. And that complexity means that everything depends on everything to some degree. And that also has implications for the way we uh, should be managing the world. And I, I believe that co-learning, co-creation, coordination, cooperation, co-evolution are important principles. But anyway, you know, this is a course where we value free thinking. Uh, what we want you to do is take a subject where ethics can be of importance, and then basically look at the pros and cons of a particular technology or different ways of using that kind of technology and how a different way of using it can really make a difference for people and for society. So we really sharpen our understanding for these kinds of digital technologies that hold a huge opportunity for people if we use them right. Okay, so hopefully after that course, we'll be better prepared to make a significant contribution to society. Thanks.